Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gents, whenever you may be. Welcome back to the Algorithmic Advantage. Today, part two of our extended discussion with the two quants from Takahe Capital, Maritz Siebert and Maritz Haydn. Um, a very quick note before we just launch straight into it. One, of course, you've got to go back and listen to part one. So go and do that if you haven't already. Listen to part one, you'll need that context to enjoy the extended discussion. And one other quick note, right at the end of our discussion, some kind of uh, alarms went off in Germany that affected every phone, and, and we had some alarms going off in the background, which was pretty disconcerting, but only for the last minute or two, and I tried to silence it where I could. Um, so <laughs> that's something to look forward to. We're keeping it real here on the Algorithmic Advantage. Anyway, let's just get straight into the show. Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review, or even buy us a coffee via the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I would like to move into Takahi and, and, and understand <clears throat> the fund uh, and the different products or the different funds and then how that um, relates to the different strategies that you trade with the philosophies that you bring in and was it always trend following and is it always trend following and I know that you trade momentum in spread so I'm curious as to the justification as to why uh, momentum should even exist in that market. Before I ask that I, I kind of had something just in the back of my mind from early on from from Herr Haydn, Mr Haydn's uh, tech development and stuff and just because that's something near to my own heart and we build in Python as well just to quickly circle back to that I mean what do you guys build out uh, yourselves and um, uh, so is your whole te tech stack built up yourself and is that including back testing engines or is that including the, the auto management so software or um, just yeah I'd like to know a little bit more about that yeah, the, the goal is definitely to build everything ourselves. Um, at the moment, we are still consuming some things from third parties. So, for example, at the moment, we are um, getting some of the markets pre-rolled via third party software. But um, we have our own systems. We have essentially, even before um, at our various gigs, built all of that ourselves. So the whole data infrastructure as well as the back testing engine, as well as the, as the auto generation and then reconciliation. That is kind of the full thing that we have. We have no automated um, auto execution at the moment. So I'm also doubtful that we will build it. So there will always be kind of like execution trading on top. And then of course, with the back testing comes all of the simulations, um, all of the things that might come in as well. Like we discussed uh, trend following on stocks before that is a completely different engine if you look at previously futures trading, right? So we are also using options, which is not done in our case in a fully systematic way, which is something I would definitely like to add to the whole system in a more systematic way, even just for screening as well. But in general, it's, it's all built in house. And that's kind of like the big benefit of having done that before. Um, and also linking up to the previous question on volatility and volatility targeting. It's not that we haven't done it. We have been there before. So Moritz and I have designed these products. We have kind of been hatching these products uh, in the jobs. So we know why they are out there and how they work and what the pitfalls are. And the same then for the trading systems. We have built different trading systems, either for third parties or for ourselves. Um, so it's, it's really, I would say, the big benefit now of also being on our own and trading on our own that we are finally able to put this all together because I just, as a programmer, I just find it very satisfying to have the full mm -hmm. control and not kind of relying on someone else. So if something goes Masters wrong, I know destiny. exactly. It's, it's a very lot of, it's very nice. It makes things easier. Of course, it kind of like you have the, um, 
I would say responsibility for all of the systems, but at least I know what's going on. And in general, these processes are super robust. Now, nowadays with uh, cloud computing, you can deploy those things easily. Everyone can start a process and generate trades or look at things that are going wrong. We can easily scale across markets. For example, if we move upwards from the 90 markets that we are trading to a few hundred, that's just kind of a little configuration and nothing else changes, which is extremely satisfying. So I, I like that stuff. I just like That's things great. that automate and that scale because as Morris said, like programmers are lazy. We like to kind of like go out for, for surf as well. Programmers so when do, you both do on the beach and do surf as well. It does yeah, happen. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I was it's thinking nice when you're both on the beach having your martinis, um, <laughs> who does the order execution between the two of you? It's all done. <laughs> like we, uh, <laughs> We we both do it. When when I was in Thailand, uh, Maritz was doing some of that stuff, um, but but I do too. You know what, Richard? It isn't it isn't anything that I mind, um, and it is nothing that is too time consuming. To be yep. honest, um, yep. first of all, I think some of the external software systems out there, um, in my opinion, they have become very expensive. Uh, they cost a lot of money and they create a lot of dependency on your organization yeah. for really no reason. We'd like to have the flexibility to not be connected or, you know, tied forever to one of these systems. And um, so we're not we're not routing orders automatically to execution. Um, we do produce orders. We um, look at them, review them. We make sure that they are correct. It's kind of like think about it like a mini execution desk which and this will be roles as well Moritz roles as well but this is you know you can upload it then into the order execution system or you can just manually create an order ticket and the way the frequency the speed with which we trade this is not something where we need to sit in front of the screen all day and execute you know 500 orders and spend our entire time doing that it's when we have an order um, we can place the order, we can park it, uh, we can activate it for a certain period of time when the market is liquid, whatever. It is It is not too much work. And um, I think the manual, the manual process of, you know, taking the order manually to market is, it is helpful for me. It is, yeah. I like it when I have touch points with the portfolio because every time I do this, like um, I'm there, I see the stuff that's moving, um, what is in the portfolio. It's it, it, it keeps me very much connected to the thing, which is what I like. And for instance, to, to give you one example, because nothing is error free, um, we were a little bit late to roll the Canadian bond futures uh, the other day. Um, they were kind of like approaching or getting into the tender period and bid offer spreads were widening on the spread. You know, you could, if, if you had just automatically routed the rollover order in the CG, the Canadian government bonds, um, to get out of the position, you would have paid through the nose, right? So it is, um, you know, us having a look at the order book, having yeah. a look at, you know, the depth of the order book, how has liquidity developed over the past couple of days, you know, how has open interest developed from one contract to the next at what time of the day? This is what we do. And even if it only saves us a few hundred bucks, or a few thousand bucks, you know, it is, um, I'm incredibly proud of saving that money yeah. and not, and not your, your medium to long term Moritz, uh, would you say medium to long term and whole? Yeah. Long term. Long term. So how many, long -term how many trades a year would we be looking at on average, given that you're placing them <clears> manually? Oh, um, well, we have about, um, say, you know, a thousand or so round terms, a million a year. It is, um, Every day, I think today we're going to do three or four rollover trades. Yesterday we had, um, I think, rolled some of the currencies. I mean, there's, I would say in a given week, let's just say there is one day in a week where just nothing happens. There is another day in the week where very, very little happens, maybe one or two rollover trades. And then there is, uh, there's two days where, oh yeah, we're getting an exit or we're getting into a new position and, um, you know, that type of stuff. But it is, um, it is a little bit more, 
uh, involved with uh, the spread system that we trade because you have two legs and not just one, right? So um, there's also uh, a couple of ways to get into these trades. You could trade the single legs, you can trade the spread markets where they are available, you can trade TAS markets. We do all of that stuff. So we look at that and see what, uh, what makes most sense. Also, some spreads are liquid at different points in time, depending on where you are on the curve. So this is this is this is a bit different than trading the S&P 500 futures where liquidity is concentrated in the first quarter contract always and you don't really have to look at the you know March 24 contract in the S&P 500 it's just uh, yeah it, it, it's probably listed already but who cares nobody nobody's trading there but deck this is a good segue Mark. Could, is could, trading. You, could you explain your three programs sort of to the the, the viewer out there um so in terms of um what styles they are. Do you trade them as single programs or do you trade them across programs or how do you use them in your allocation in a traditional portfolio, mm -hmm. all of that sort of stuff? Can you give us an idea of that? Yeah. Yeah, we have two programs that we trade on a standalone basis and we have, we have one fund which combines these programs, but it is not a simple addition of these programs because there's some netting effects which I can which I can get to in a minute but the two standalone programs that we have one rich is really a classic um, trend following system it is a breakout based system it is what you and I would call these simple systems which aren't actually that simple because they are a piece of beauty it is it is relatively long term I don't think I'm the there, 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 there's traders out there that trade more long term than we do uh, with even longer term look back windows and hold periods. Uh, but I would definitely put it into um, into the, the long term period. Our average holding period per trade is actually 200 days. And we have some winning trades that would go on for 600, 700 days. So many years we would stay in these positions. And um, so this is one program. Again, no volatility targeting, very classic. I think that is the most resilient, most robust, most protective approach across a lot of markets. Small bets per trade? Small bets per trade, uh, equal bet sizes proportionally or appropriately sized, right? So we're risking a certain percentage of our trade level, and then we would size the position based on um, a recent average true range that we've observed, um, have an initial stop, an exit. Um, um, so we we'll keep Jerry the, happy with this loss. one. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I think you would be happy with that. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, you know, Jerry has the same philosophy or very, very similar philosophy. Paul Mulvaney, I guess, has a similar philosophy. There is a handful of traders in the world still that I guess trade trend following in this very crude, raw, classic call it caveman, whatever. But I think the real deal, um, this is it. No smoothing. Or uh, Sage, we're not really cavemen, are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm happy with it. Uh, well, hey, can, I, can I ask a, a question there while you're, while you're explaining that, Moritz? Um, to what extent are the these strategies identical and applied across all those different markets? Or, and to what extent might they be have to be tweaked per market? Yeah, no, no tweaking per market. Uh, I don't, and the system doesn't care uh, whether we're dealing with crude or corn or the DAX index. Um, they are all part of the family. We treat them the same way. We use the same system, the same parameters, um, and that's it. Because if we if we change the system. Uh, on a market by market basis, we would really destroy the statistical evidence that we could observe in the past, you know, because then we're not creating a coherent sample size. We're creating many, many samples, which in and by themselves then don't have statistical foundation any longer that would allow us to say that the parameters that we're choosing or that plateau that I mentioned is actually relevant and, um, and, um, and working so so this is the one system that we trade and and i'm really proud of it uh, i must say because of the fact that it is this classic type of thing and 
I think, uh, you know, with, with, with a few of the names that we've mentioned, you know, these, uh, we're, we're in our little group here. Uh, we punch above our weight. CTA, <laughs> punch above our weight. Some of the, or most of the other CTIs, they have uh, morphed and migrated into, you know, more advanced techniques and um, I like hopefully to be in a position at some point to compete against them because I think that long run, we have a superior approach because we're stripping the system from these unnecessary overlays and, and additions, which I think cost money and um, uh, are just good for the short term feel good experience, but not good for our long term objective, which I've said at the beginning is really to make money. This is why we're in the game. And um, whether I'm down 1% today or tomorrow is really it must not be of any consequence to the approach that we're running. Uh, we're looking to make, uh, you know, double digit returns doesn't happen every year, but you know, this is, this is why we're trading. Um, and, um, so yeah. And then the, the other system is a, uh, system that trades commodity calendar spreads. And really, I have to say it's, I've, I've said this before is I got so intrigued by. Can you explain that? Explain that to me. Cause I, I'm a novice in this area. So yeah. yeah. So a calendar spread is a spread that is intra-market. So it's in the same market, say crude oil, and you're trading at different points of the futures curve, different maturities. So one example would be to be, say, long December crude oil and short March crude oil. That is the December March calendar spread. If you're long December and short March, you would be long the spread, right? And that means that you would expect the relationship to increase. You think that December, the price of the December contract will move higher, will we'll, we'll, yeah, uh, have a greater percentage return than, than the March spread because you're long. So you want that spread to widen. And um, I got so, I mean, by the way, this is something that we did and, and I put a lot of research and work into this um, while still working for the banks, but also at a quantum, this was the first CTA that I started together with a bunch of friends. We were very much focused on um, trading commodity calendar spreads, but a lot of this uh, research was colored and biased by things that I had seen. And this comes back to your point, Simon, what did I take away from these banks? You know, inside the banks, we were running these QIS quantitative investment strategies businesses where at the beginning, they were very core fit. You come up with all sorts of, it's still a big, big business today, by the way, right? And, but it, it has become more professional. But back then you would create indices inside banks for the sole reason of selling them to clients. So you'd be creating a back test um, of a strategy and then present that to a client and make it the underlying for a structured product. Mm. This is why, by the way, Ritz was saying it had to be volatility controlled because when you vault control or vault target it to a certain level, right, then you can actually very easily price a derivative on it. You get rid of all the Vega dependencies of all the, you know, like some of the Greeks that would yeah. Yeah, yeah. make it very difficult to hedge. <sighs> so, you know, those indices were produced and, and you look at the things and um, there are some naive strategies that look very appealing. Um, like, you know, we were speaking about short volatility. I mean, this was short equity vol or short commodity vol, short whatever fixed income vol. I mean, these were the first ones to pop up, short equity mm -hmm. vol in particular, because it's the simplest thing to do. And it looks great. You, you know, you change one, obviously, you know, 2008, 2009, you take a massive hit. You know, the researcher changes the parameter a bit, introduces a filter and say, we would only do this if whatever the spot is above the 20 day moving average. And then boom, you essentially erase the experience of the that large loss from the history because you've curfit your system to just avoid uh, that single and this occurrence. And goes back but, to the skin in the game too. Like I see how different it is working in the bank there where those guys aren't, their, their livelihood isn't necessarily influenced by having a bad year and they probably move on to another bank. It's a completely different story when you're running a yes. business and you believe in the product and you want to have a really good product and be around for 20, 30, 40 years. There is to, to, to circle back on the, on the commodity spreads. I mean, there are systems and strategies that work for a period of time and then they stop working. I want to give you 
one example that Moritz and I actually wrote about is is the Bitcoin basis trade. You know, we had a great success with that Bitcoin basis trade where you could be long spot Bitcoin short the futures contract against it and essentially, uh, you know, realize something between 20 and 40 percent annualized roll yields. That trade has gone away. It has attracted too many eyeballs. Um, another example, and by the way, I'm not sure if we have time to get into that. It's one of the um, very rare occasions where I removed a market from my trend polling portfolio, the dividend futures futures um, for the simple reason that there's a real structural change in European dividend index futures uh, that used to be a motivated seller, uh, which is the investment bank, because they were long dividends and they were selling their dividend risk in a hedging process by selling these dividend futures. And that has largely gone away because these indices created by banks have changed to become decrement indices where essentially they imply all the dividend risk and they give the dividend risk in through the index back to the client who now carries it so there is a big big player a big elephant in the room that has gone away and changed the dynamics of um how the front curve for the front part of the dividend futures curve now works um and when you look into the back curve of these dividend future indices like you know deck 24 25 26 is tradable this is essentially a a beta play on the euro stocks 50 so you can have a more efficient um experience by trading the Eurostox 50 if that is what you wanted to do because it is the larger contract and these dividend futures contracts are relatively small in terms of their point value so and and so that trade has gone away you could you could engage you could essentially buy short data dividend futures um um say 12 to 6 months before they expire and you would buy them at a discount because that motivated big, big seller, all these banks that had dividend risk, they were, you know, depressing the price. And, and then it pulled to par as futures contracts do. They, you know, uh, migrate to, um, uh, to, to spot at the end of the day, uh, which was the realized dividend. And they were always much higher. So you could get a, you know, too sharp type of trade simply by doing that pull to par trade. It goes away. But then back to the commodities, the, the trade that was, um, a good trade uh, is like, you know, when GSCI and Dow Jones AIG, now Dow Jones UBS, when you had this big commodities movement in the 2000s, um, all of a sudden people were getting interested in commodities and they were allocating a lot of money to these indices because that was the easiest thing to do. These indices left a footprint uh, in the market and people knew exactly when and where. Uh, you know, we, it's an index methodology, which you can download from, you know, the GSCI website that details exactly what the weight of crude oil in that index is and when they're going to roll crude oil futures contracts. So by providing liquidity during the roll period to these large index rollers and swap traders or by and or front running the role because you know what was going to happen, you could really have a very nice strategy. Now, these things and all the things that are published in academic papers, all these strategies that, you know, pop up on the internet, they attract eyeballs. And if they are too good to be true or too simple to execute, then the alpha that is attached to them naturally decays. And, you know, this is no surprise that is to be expected in a somewhat efficient market. And so when you then, when you don't recognize that, and I think Simon, you've mentioned my interview on chat with traders where I spoke about a warrant arbitrage strategy, the same thing, you know, it is a strategy that works for a period of time, but you have to recognize when um, the, 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 you know, uh, the environment has changed and um, it has decayed. And, and if you then force yourself and press yourself to still trade it because you fell in love with that strategy, you can't let go. You're usually setting yourself up for a negative experience because then it starts to become that negatively tailed, negatively skewed um, return distribution. There's just too much money clustering in that thing. And this is what we had or some of the, the, the commodity strategies that were especially this liquidity provision strategies, they have that tendency of like they work nicely, right? If everything stays as is, if there's a lot of, you know, flows coming through the index roll period, you could take the benefit of that. But if not, um, you know, the it, it, it turns out that it's more of a negatively skewed um, return yeah. distribution, the opposite of what we have with our trend following profile. So, Again, I stepped away from that and said, like, this is just not what I'd like to have. I'd really like to surround myself with traits that can develop positive skew, have a much larger 
um, upside and a very controlled limited downside all the time. And if I can no longer have that, then I need to step away. And the way we're trading commodity spreads now is that we're realizing that there is momentum in spread markets. So why is um, that? And in in the calendar spreads, it is essentially because of, um, you know, seasonality, you know, natural gas in winter is <laughs> worth more, usually the natural gas in the summer, old crop, new crop, funding dynamics, storage dynamics. So these curves, they shift because, you know, these commodities are fantastic because this is where reality takes over they're real goods mm. it is not like you know a, a a currency or like the dividend future for instance right it is um therefore also when you trade these spreads they have a clock ticking on them they have a natural maturation point in my example with the s p 500 future i can create a continuous time series by rolling that future by connecting every quarter every quarter every quarter and you know back adjust for differences at the time of the roll that creates one time series but a spread in the example that i gave the december march crude oil spread i could theoretically roll this into a january april spread but this is no longer the same mm. thing this is a this is a different part of the curve in crude it may not make that much of a difference but in natural gas or in say cotton it makes all the difference right so the spread only has a limited time period to live and when the short dated lack comes close to first notice or expiration it goes out because this is when the reality when physics take over when in a commodity that is physically delivered you're getting close to that point there's no longer any speculation as to what the price of that commodity could be 12 months hence it is you take delivery or you make delivery right now and that's the price i just want to ask I'm sorry Rich, just dynamics. want to bring this back for the newer trader as well maritz like is this just too too difficult for them do you have to construct these spreads manually yourself uh using the different um individual contracts is this something that a newer quantitative trader could get their head around you get your head around this, uh, but yes, we're looking at individual contracts. So it is a more involved, say, data acquisition exercise where we're not pre-rolling the contracts into the continuous time series. We're really looking at every point on the curve and we're creating uh, a large number of permutations across that curve. When you think about crude oil, it is the easiest example where you have monthly expirations. You can take the first minus the second and the first minus the third and the first minus the fourth, but also the second minus the third and the second minus the fourth, right? All the way. So you have hundreds of combinations in crude oil alone and you do this across all the commodities. It creates thousands of permutations of spreads. Which sounds incredibly difficult to backtest. It, but doable. Well, the computer does yeah. the magic. It is doable, yes. And um, now, what I I think the important thing that I want to you know bring across is that um, I was so motivated by hearing other CTAs talking about synthetic markets and trading cross market spreads and um, all that type of stuff that I really wanted and probably still want to get into that. And it is a part of the research and part of the. It's something that's just very interesting because it does have the potential to add to your portfolio and give you massive diversification benefit. But whatever way I sliced and diced it, I really couldn't get it to work. Like, you know, trading DAX versus crude oil or trading corn versus um, Canadian government bonds. Uh, you can create all these spreads, and but how do you create them? Do you create them as one minus the other? Do you create them as one over the other? How do you you know, take different currencies into account? How do you take different roll dates into account? The Canadian government expires at a different point in time than crude oil. So when you roll one, I mean, you may be shifting to powder. I just couldn't get that to work in the way I liked it. Like, and you know now what I like, which is um, limited downside, the potential for unlimited upside. And I just couldn't get these spreads to... Um, to do that and they, they just it wouldn't make money so i gave up and and put that to the side went back to the commodity calendar spread so now we're not talking about dax versus canadian government bonds we're talking crude versus crude or corn versus corn at different points in time in the future 
um, and we take care of seasonalities. We don't want to be crossing seasonalities because that would have a propensity of getting us into short spreads all the time. If if we allowed the system to do that, it, it would sounds tell us like you've stripped back to simplicity. Uh, it, it sounds to me yes. like you've stripped back a away from ephemeral edges to more enduring mm -hmm. edges with simplicity. So your commodity trading spreads, Correct. your trend following. They're, they're sort of almost universal features found in the market as opposed to these ephemeral pattern sort of based sort of, you know, short term edge opportunities. Yes. And same thing. Like I would give them a uh, initial risk budget, an entry and exit and a stop loss. Uh, I'm not allowing these uh, spreads to become too large of a loser. Um, if they develop fantastic, we'll just write them. We can't write them for as long as the outright market positions because of what I've explained. They have a clock ticking on them. So they have a shorter hold period. But what I've discovered, and this is why I really trade them, is they make money in and by themselves. It is based on trend following principles, um, a profitable strategy. And it is a very nice addition to the single market trend following system in terms of here we're combining systems that really are uncorrelated to one another. So you never and have to worry is... about turning them off at all because you know, you're know you confident in their enduring features. So it's not like... Uh, you know, a strategy where you say, if it reaches a certain drawdown, I'm going to turn it off. You can trade these with confidence into the future. Um, effectively. The confidence backed up by the fact that I'll keep the losses small and I, um, you know, I, uh, if it doesn't work, then we'll get out. This is, yeah, but this you won't strategy hop. Piece, but there's, there's no strategy hopping no, here. Not, no, yeah. no, exactly. They, they, they'll sit, they'll sit as two independent programs next to one another and, and we'll just trade them exactly. And the thing, when you combine it, which is what we do. So in this funds, is your quant, this is not, so this is the, uh, global quantitative fund that combines them. And Mark, right, just while you're right. wrapping up, it, cause we will have to wrap up soon. Can you just talk to the use of options as well? Cause I understand that you do use options and i'd be interested to know a bit more about yes. that especially again the difficulty potentially in back testing or to what extent that's just discretionary yeah yeah no it is 100 percent discretionary i mean this is my background having traded these 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 options for a long long period of time um i cannot and i don't want to systematize it i think that is very difficult to do um the way we use options is to really prime and uh, magnify the potential outlier trade. So where you would put us more into the box of looking to buy options, getting long convexity and long upside as opposed to selling options. And um, most of the things that we would look to do, but we can't always do it because the markets don't make it available to us, but we would like to engage in what we call delta replacement trades. And to give an example, when you have a position that has um, let's use crude oil again, right? It has your long crude oil. It has made you a lot of money. Um, the futures curve becomes speculated, which means long dated, the long dated forward is relatively cheap compared to spot and flat price. If implied volatilities are low, it gives me an opportunity to replace some of the linear futures delta that we have by being long crude oil futures with long, long dated call options, right? So I could replace one contract of crude oil, which has a delta of one with four call options that have a 0.25 delta each for the same delta exposure. But now I've transformed something that was a linear risk into something that is a positively convex nonlinear risk that can at maximum develop into a delta four position in my example. You know, because I don't forecast the price of crude oil. It can go to 200, it can go to 2000. What I want to maximize is my exposure to that outlier move so that we can really hit the cover of the ball. You don't have to worry about time to expire. You don't have to worry about time to expire. So, so, so yeah, this, this is a dimension and that is one of the reasons why we do it discretionarily is, uh, in the example where we trade these long dated options, um, you know, the time decay to theta is, uh, is not much. There is not much bleed, um, and the position is more a function of longer-term funding and volatility dynamics. Um, 
we tend to stay away from buying short dated options because of that, you know, theta effect that you've just mentioned. Um, one of the recent examples where we've added long optionality to the portfolio is, um, I think five or six weeks ago, we, um, observed as quants statistically that implied volatility in the S and P 500 and in some other equity indices as well was, um, not historically cheap in terms of the VIX. The VIX was trading at um, around 13 spot VIX, but uh, skew was very flat and like out of the money, longer dated out of the money put options on the S&P 500 were historically cheap. They've never been cheaper. So we took advantage of that. Again, you know, being thinking about these silent risks, you know, where, uh, where long equities generally no longer across the board Again, I can't forecast where equities are going. Um, I hope they do go higher because on a net basis, we are long, right? But here was a possibility to buy some insurance and also the VIX futures for a relatively low price. And we do this discretionarily because, hey, you know, if and when these silent risks materialize, then I do have protection in the portfolio and nothing makes me happier to see um, my portfolio behave in a resilient and good way on days where uh, the, the going gets tough, right? Then that is, that that just feels really good. Um, so we, yeah, we, we do that to protect ourselves if and when it makes mm -hmm. sense. Most of the time we can't do it because the contracts aren't available or because um, the pricing isn't right for us and we think we'd be paying too much and then we just stick to the systematic process. So this is, this is only the, this is only rarely. Okay. Um, and another, I mean, we were getting over mm -hmm. time here, but you know, essentially we're on every time, every day we get up, we're looking at these things and I'm very interested, like sniffing out trading opportunities that are uh, asymmetric in the sense that, Oh, Here's something, even with futures, you can do this. In the spreads, for instance, like, you know, the TTF European gas spreads, summer, winter, they are trading so cheap, or they have been trading so cheap, as if nothing had ever happened, as if no Ukraine war was going on, as if no supply risks existed in terms of LNG, and if there were no competition globally for LNG. You guys in Australia, there's now an LNG strike going on, right, which has moved that spread a little higher here. You know, it's priced like smooth sailing. All the risk has gone away. And you go like, okay, so this is a summer winter spread, March versus April. March is more expensive than April because you do have the risk of running out of storage or having a cold spell here in Europe. And they're pricing that stuff as if it were like 2018 and plain sailing, right? Uh, with pipe gas coming from Russia nonstop, but this is no longer the case. So you have limited downside here because that spread, I mean, theoretically, it can go negative, uh, but you know, if it does go negative, it's going to be a few cents negative. It's now trading at 1.20 or 1.30, something like that. So I'm, I'm risking, say, $1.30. But if something happens, could happen, I don't know, right? Some geopolitical event happens. Um, something happens with Putin, something, whatever. You, you guys go on a complete strike and don't deliver any LNG anymore. That thing can actually go to 20. Mm. So, so Moritz um, H, so, yeah. you know, this is um, when Moritz S starts sort of thinking about these opportunities, what are you doing all the time? We've got to validate it, we've got to validate it. <laughs> Show me the data. Yeah, definitely looking at the data, but it's hard to back this, right? Um, and these are, if it's related to macro events, then it's really about can we find historical events where we can narrow it down and kind of like how big is the downside risk versus how much is the potential upside. Moritz does that already intuitively. I'm What I can do is I can help and look at more events and basically try to find the right data to see if this really holds true. But in general, like, of course, uh, I'm relying on his good guidance here. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's got very good guidance. I've got to give him that. Gentlemen, how and quickly should we with with go, the Rich? So I was just going to say with the um, global quant funds. So, what sort of allocations is it taking in from your systematic trend and your spread momentum program? And then, can you also talk to um, if a traditional portfolio comes to you? Sort of what sort of material allocation do you recommend to them um, with your funds? <laughs> 
hundred mm-hmm. percent. Uh, exactly. It, it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet, Ridge. Um, we're not yet in the space where we're talking to these institutional clients that will go like, Oh, you know, how much should I add to my portfolio? Um, maybe that'll come at some point, but the answer would generally be more. Um, have you tested it uh, with your you back know, test I, with the inclusion of your, your programs into traditional portfolios? I think I've done that once with a 60, 40 portfolio or just, you yep. know, adding it to the S and P 500, but it, it, it doesn't surprise you that it's improving. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. um, as for me personally, I don't, I don't have a S and P 500 ATF and I add my own fund to it. Um, I have everything in my fund. Yes. I thought, you know, this is my portfolio. Yeah. That's it. And there's no, that's the way we do it. The, yeah. Yeah. But also like, you know, when, when I say on the one hand that I'm a trend following trader in the equities and I'd be long equities and short equities, depending on what, you know, uh, what their trend is and how they have recently behaved. Why would I, on the other hand, sit on a uh, long S and P 500 ETF, which is completely against the philosophy that I have when it comes to trading? Yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe you, you would do that in a tax preferred account or something like that, where I counted the trading. I get that, but so we haven't sold our soul I, to the devil yet. No, 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 no <laughs> not doing that. And gentlemen, as we um, yeah. as we start to wrap up, then. Um, let me know if there's anything in particular. particular oh, one thing, like Simon, on. thir- yes, your third, yeah, your third business partner. He's unfortunately not here. Can you um, just give us a bit of information about him and his involvement in the firm? Yeah, his, his name is Matthias. Uh, by the way, also working together with Matthias uh, since Immunity Green Investment Partners time. So this is this I think is a great benefit is that we uh, we like each other, we're friends, we have worked together, which is which is important because you just know what you know how other people work, operate, what they do. Um, and Matthias is essentially our quant engineer. So he is um, he is really into the Wies. Moritz can talk uh, in more detail about that and, you know, setting up the infrastructure, um, databases, cloud deployments, all that type of stuff. Yeah. So I've worked with Matthias at Scalable already. And to give you the dimensions, we managed around 5 billion of assets for 250,000 clients um, in automated portfolio trading. And the complications there, of course, the complexity arises uh, through the sheer number of portfolios for different custodians that you are trading at the same time. The strategy was also essentially momentum with a vol control strategy on top. But like we have managed that with a very small team and he was working with me at the time. He then kind of joined Moritz and myself at um, Munich Reinvestment Partners. And sorry, that was an emergency alarm. And the um, <laughs> let's wrap the podcast up. <laughs> and <laughs> I, w- I just wanted to close with uh, additionally, Matthias' name also starts with an M, which is of course great, right? Yeah, we no, go. That's hard. Triple M, the, the exactly. triple M guys, triple M radio triple station. M. Yes, well done. Um, <laughs> all right, so can we quiet the beeping there or not? No, you know what it is? This is actually, um, this is a countrywide alert yeah. that once a year they're testing this here. I didn't have that. I read this morning in the news. I'm trying to quiet it. It can't be quieted. It's a countrywide alert. Don't worry um, about it. It's exciting. All the sirens are going yes. up. Sort of yes. like, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. I thought Putin alerts. might have got a bit over ambitious. <laughs> People just stand and <laughs> shout if there's a countrywide <laughs> alert here. We don't have anything so sophisticated. Um, at... As we wrap right. up then, guys, um, gosh, we covered a lot of ground, and that's fantastic. Um, I guess feel free to to summarise as as ever as however you would like. The thoughts that come to mind for me are just like the last couple of years. Um, I think markets, and and this year also, markets have been different for some some might say it's the same old same old um certain things have changed obviously in a big picture uh regime paradigm things are changing as we as we go through this uh, (laughs) as we go through this change and 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 perhaps as you're experiencing smaller changes in the markets um is it everything remains the same because that's what we believe in and to what extent could new ideas 
come into the uh, process and what R&D do you do along the way to keep refreshing those ideas, if at all? And try and make it quick before you get down to your bomb shoulders. Yeah, before the bombs go off. <laughs> Mark, you have to click. You can put it on silent. If you unlock your phone. You can't put it on silent. If I, you unlock your phone, it will I go away it. and then go in flight mode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, turned, I turned my phone off. It's still yeah, beeping. And it's something wrong. Mine stopped. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Turn your phone off and it's still beeping. I'd throw it in the ocean at that point. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, new research. Look, um, um, yes, I'm, I, I love doing research. I love engaging myself with these new ideas. I follow them along. I'm very motivated to look into new stuff. But truth be told... It's very tough to beat that trend following approach of uh, keeping losses small and letting the winners run. And I think this is the guiding framework that um, I'm not stepping away from. That has crept into my life. I'm very happy about it. Um, best thing that ever happened. And I think it's the best thing that you can do in trading. All right. Fantastic. I think, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm listening attentively, Rich. Um, guys, given the... <clears throat> given the, excuse me <clears throat> given the um the alarms going off in in deutschland over there let's let's wrap it up um maritz one and maritz two let us know how people can get in contact with you or, or learn more and um and we'll sign off thank you both for uh entertaining us and inviting us to your new podcast um it's thanks been for great. coming it's really been great Paul. long Thank you, guys. Two hours, and uh, I wish you a lot of success with uh, with that new thing. Um, it's great. How do, we, how do people Keep get in going. contact with you and learn more? Either follow us on Twitter, so we are both there, or just head to chakahe.capital and um, use the contact form. That's the easiest way to reach out. Either Moritz, S, or myself, we will answer. So we are always there. Any way you want, reach out. Twoquants.com is the alternative, which is our blog. You can reach out via that as well. And yeah, we are happy to take any questions and great being there. Thanks for the invite. Thanks so much, gentlemen. All right, we'll sign off and we'll leave it there. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives. So nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.